when we look at the current state of human-machine interaction, all too often we find a machine-centered approach to design. Let me give you an example. You all know what this is, right? Standard computer keyboard. This one is a little bit bigger, a little more colorful, a little more fun than most. Might be a great design for kids, right? Well, how many of you know the story behind the layout of the standard keyboard keys? A few of you? OK, well, let me tell you. Legend has it that when the inventors of the typewriter were designing the layout of the keys of the QWERTY keyboard, they, were, they knew that if people typed too fast, the mechanical keys would jam. So they deliberately designed the keyboard layout to slow people down. And this is the keyboard we still use today. The future of human-machine interaction needs to have a human-centered approach. I'm going to talk about two components of this, innovation and empathy. Let's start with innovation. The best innovation solves human-centered problems. As an engineer and entrepreneur, I look for problems that people have, and then I look for creative ways to use technology to solve these problems. In other words, I try and find problems worth solving. And this is a design strategy that I've used in many domains of research. For example, helping astronauts to control robots in space, uh, working with surgeons to use virtual reality technologies to perform minimally invasive surgery. But it is in working with children with disabilities that the idea of optimizing human performance through human-centered design really hits home. This is my friend Kevin, and he has cerebral palsy. And that makes it very difficult for him to manipulate objects in his environment. So he doesn't have a good concept of basic developmental milestones like cause and effect. He doesn't understand that what he does can have an impact on the world around him. So working with our design partners at the University of Maryland's Human Computer Interaction Lab, a design team that includes children, by the way, we took apart a remote control car. And we put together a really fun robot. Gesturebot is controlled by wireless wearable sensors. So we put a wearable sensor on Kevin's arm. And when Kevin moved his arm, Gesturebot moved its arm. Nothing. Kevin didn't understand that he had had an impact on his environment. He didn't recognize that that movement was attached to him. Lots of things happen in his environment that he has no control over. So we stepped it up a bit. We put armbands on both his arms. Now, and then we mapped the sensors so that when Kevin raised his arms, Gesturebot raised his arms and spun around. He got it. The light bulb went on. And once your brain makes that connection, there's no turning back. So we've continued this work with therapists and teachers and just finished a study with the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where we showed that when you physically operate a robot to perform goal-directed movements, you get better outcomes than with traditional physical therapy. But is optimizing physical performance enough? One of the things that we found in working with children and robots is that children build a relationship with robots. And they draw other people into this relationship. Their therapists, their siblings, their parents. Now, this may sound like standard behavior for a child. And as a parent of typically developing six and eight-year-olds, I take this form of social engagement for granted. But if you're a child with autism, it can be very difficult to engage him. We've had parents in tears because their child has come over to them, taken their hand, 
and said, come meet Cosmobot. Imagine, a piece of technology has created a connection between a parent and a child. I contend that human-machine interaction should create empathy. Empathy keeps our focus on the human. Technology is useful and good, but it's the humans using it that matter. I admit it, it's easy to get carried away by technology. This graphic is one that I created, fantasizing about how kids with physical disabilities could connect to their world through uh, robots and virtual reality technology. Um, and I think that's common when we think of the future of technology, to think about smart robots and immersive virtual environments, movies like The Matrix. You may even uh, think about the idea of the technological singularity when machine intelligence surpasses human intelligence. But there is an alternative, an alternative way of envisioning the future that begins with the human. And in this future, we don't, only, we don't just physically connect with our worlds, we consciously connect. This is a figure from Odi Hassan's work at Princeton University. And they found that using EEG and fMRI, they could show that when I listen to you and I understand you, we are literally on the same wavelength. Our brain waves start to synchronize. I found this incredible. That means that when you think you have a connection with someone, you do. <laughs> and this connection is measurable. And if you can measure it, you can probably capture it and manipulate it. Wow. This has potentially huge ramifications for human to human to human to human interaction. Some colleagues and I coined the term cognitive coupling to describe the synchronization of neural signals between people. We were interested in the idea that if you could capture these signals and connect them using computer technology, you've connected the crowd to the cloud via neural signals. This is starting to sound very sci-fi. Star Trek's Borg Collective comes to mind. And some of you may remember, the Borg Collective used neural interfaces to connect every member of their society to each other. But they were very machine-centric. They were looking for technological superiority. And the result was a disastrous society with a leader who ruled with complete authority. <laughs> no, this is not the Borg Queen. I didn't have rights to use a Star Trek image, so you're stuck with an image of me in my Star Trek uh, Halloween costume that my mom got me. <laughs> but what, what would a human-centric collective consciousness look like? It would have to be one that was based on innovation and empathy. These are natural human capacities that can be enhanced by technology. In particular, by capturing and communicating the neural connectivity that we already share. And in this collective consciousness, what are the problems worth solving? Do we become more aware of the world around us because we share perceptions, other people's perceptions of the world? Do we build empathy as we feel the suffering of our fellow human beings? If you think of this group consciousness as an individual, then it becomes in our own self-interest to fix the pain and suffering in this world, to optimize the potential of every human being. In a collective consciousness, every problem is worth solving because every problem is shared. The future of human-machine interaction depends upon us saying yes to both empathy and innovation. As an engineer and entrepreneur, I say yes 
to solving problems where human and machines interact, where innovation and empathy meet, and where love and need are one. Robert Frost says this best in the last stanza of Two Tramps in Mud Time, and so I'll end with that. But yield who will to their separation. My object in living is to unite my advocation and my vocation, as my two eyes make one in sight. Only when love and need are one, and work is play for mortal stakes, is the deed ever really done for heaven and the future's sakes. Thank you.